Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to start off with the little icebreaker. Um, I want you guys to get in the group with one partner. And perfect. Um, what you're going to do is you're going to interview each other. So um, I will ask um, Debbie her name. I will put on her name on my paper. And I, everything she answers is going on my paper. Okay, so I'll give you guys about one to two minutes, depending if you guys get done early, to do that. So go ahead and introduce each other. Luckily, I already know your name. What's your name? Two hours and two days. Oh, I'm making one up. Okay, what goes on two hours? We interview each other? Yeah. Oh, okay. So how old is you? I am 23. How old are you? 20. Uh, 22. Okay. Yeah. Okay, what's, what's your age? Hotel. Canton. 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 Like I don't know. Say poetry, I guess. Poetry. My hometown is where I was born. Oh, okay. So yeah, I'm going to go with Alright, your turn. Uh, Spencer. Hi, Spencer. Is it S P E N C E R? I mean, if it's a dream yeah, job, I would say like socialite. Are you really? But if it has to be a realistic place, I guess I would like to be a tour guide in a dream job. Professional lawyer. Really? Why didn't you just go to school to be a lawyer? I don't know that kind of job. Yo, right? All that reading. Nobody has that job. That reading, though. That's just like too much. I would just say, like, probably teaching second grade somewhere during the day and being an adjunct professor. Everybody's being realistic, and I said pop star. Yo, I said a socialite. That's what I would like to be. Yeah, she was like, okay, would you want to be a socialite? It's like people that like, get paid to go to parties. She had me put down tour guide for tropical. Wait, did you know that, like, you can still do that? Tour guide for tropical. Like, it's so easy to do something like this. Really? Yeah, you just get the app. If you live in a city, you just have an app and it's, yeah, I saw it online. Yeah, but what if someone kills you? Like, come to a party and then they just hack you up. That's your own fault. You get the party. You go to, like, the, these big events that, like, sponsors want you to be at. Yeah. I would do a poetry professor at my professional party. Yeah. Okay, so, um, I will go first with sharing. Uh, my name is Miss Breer. I am 23 years old. I'm from Milwaukee, New York. Um, I have a couple favorite hobbies, reading, shopping, and doing some web. Um, my dream job would be to become a pathologist. Um, I've always loved, wanted to be a doctor, but I struggle in science, so kind of not going to help. <laughs> so does anyone else want to do a group share? So this is Sarah Hatton. She's 24. She's from Ottawa, Ontario. Her favorite hobby is hanging with her friend Jakers, and her dream job is to be a professional traveler. This is Jake Bostek. He's 23. He's from Tucker Lake. His favorite hobby is sleeping, and his dream job is to stay at home husband. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyone else want to go? Perfect answer. <laughs> uh, so this is Jessica. She's so 25. Boys. Her hometown is Massapequa. <laughs> Favorite hobby traveling and dream job flight attendant. This is Kyle. He's 25. Favorite hobby is being out of the job and her dream job is being in service. Okay, great job. So the point of this activity um, is if this was the first day of school, this is something. Fred Jones would want every teacher to implement some type of icebreaker into the classroom, um, whether it be group sharing or scavenger hunt, treasure hunt, anything like that, just to get everyone um, together to sort of mingle as a community in the classroom. Um, 
So that's why we did that ace breaker. So my uh, theory model is on Fred Jones. Who is Fred Jones? He is a PhD clinical psychologist from UC, UCLA. He began specializing with schools and families, but he focused on emotional disorders with children, how to fix, not fix them, but how to um, deal with them, and how to make their lives more productive and um, everything like that. So then he began his research in classroom management in regular and special education classrooms. He's been doing that for over 30 years. He wrote two books, um, published in 1978, Positive Classroom Discipline and Positive Classroom Instruction. He actually wanted those books to become textbooks, but at the time, um, the publishing company, McGraw Hill, they did not want to do that because back then, classroom management wasn't a class being taken or offered at all. So they said, no, let's not make a textbook out of this for a class that doesn't even exist. So after he developed methods for classroom management, he actually published tools for teaching. Um, the first published one was in 2000. The second one was 2005, his second edition. That became a textbook because now we have a classroom management class. A lot of teachers, um, pre-student teachers, should be taking classroom management. It's a requirement for some, but not every teacher. Um, his son Patrick Jones and wife JoLynn Jones, they are co-authors for the book and also advocates who go around doing workshops and um, helping the Tools for Teaching campaign. His son Brian Jones did all the illustrations for Tools for Teaching, which is over 70 illustrations in this book. Um, His management philosophy is positive classroom management and behavior control. That's the key to becoming a successful teacher, is having that under control, and you should be able to have a successful classroom and your students will get the best they can out of your class. <clears throat> so, building a classroom management system. The first part is work smart, not hard. So, in the book, he put down that you have, as a teacher, you have to deal with students goofing off during your class. You'll probably either have lunch duty, call duty, AIS, some sort of watching over students during your free time. And then you also have parent conferences after school. You have assemblies to go to. You have papers to take home to grade. You have lesson plans to work on to get ready for the next day or the following week. And he said a lot of teachers get burnt out because of this. They, some teachers even quit their job after the first two years of teaching. So the main key here is to work smart. So that means managing your time. Being, um, knowing how to do something here and not here and everything like that. So the next one is do not have squatter time. This means um, squatter time is taking class time out of the learning. So it takes about five to seven minutes for everyone to get situated when the bell rings. That's squatter time. That can be eliminated. Um, the lesson transitions, they can take five minutes if you don't transition correctly. So in your lesson plans, it's good to have transitions completely lined up. Um, also, when students go to the bathroom, sharpen pencils because they just want to get up and move, hand in homework, shuffling of papers, getting situated from the next, from the previous class to the next class. Um, that's a lot of wasted time. That adds up. So, my question for you is how can you possibly avoid having time lost at the beginning of class? How could you avoid that five to seven minutes being lost? Um, in my uh, placement, say the teacher already has like an activity or silent reading like written on the board, so the students go in and start start doing math right away, mm -hmm. um, so they know to like quickly do it. So they're just as now and look through it. So it's just like a routine. Right. Class. So kind of like a bell ringer. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. 
we're going to talk about that later too, because that's a huge, um, huge point that Fred Jones makes is doing bow ringers. So we'll talk about that too. Um, the next one is packaging the activity. So um, it's very common to see student teachers teach as input, 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 and then do the output. That's when you're going to lose students. That's when students are going to goof off. That's when they're not going to listen to you if they're just sitting there supposed to be listening to you. So effective teachers do input, output, input, output, input, output. It keeps the learning active. It keeps the students' brains active. It keeps them engaged. Um, and it keeps them awake because sometimes students do fall asleep. <laughs> um, so this is what they call as see, say, do. So it's the three steps. So you're going to listen to me say the instruction, or yeah, say the instructions. You're going to see me do it. And then you're going to do it. That's actually not work. It's supposed to be, be say, see, do. So that's how that goes. And then classroom structure. So here's the icebreakers. Um, but first, before I talk about classroom structure, has anyone ever walked into a new classroom the first day of class and then walked out thinking that teacher's going to be a pushover just because of how the tone was set on the first day? Anyone? Yeah, a lot of people. Yeah. So that's what he means by class structure. The first day of class, you need to set the tone of how the class is going to be run for the entire year, do seating arrangements, give them classroom rules, um, pretty much like how the standards are going to be, the procedures for the first day of week, how the class is going to run. Um, so that's going to set the tone of the class and how the whole year, how the whole year will go. And he definitely um, encourages icebreakers, like I said earlier. Um, it's a huge community building activity for the kids, so that'll be good. And then zones of proximity. So for the zones of proximity, this is where you have the students goofing off that you want to pay attention to. So right now, Debbie and Caitlin, they're in my red zone. They're not going to goof off if they know what's good for them. <laughs> yeah. They're not going to goof off because I'm near them. They are going to behave, everything like that. Jess, she might goof off. She's in the yellow zone, but I'm not facing her general direction. So she could be goofing off. If this room was a little bit bigger and there were students way over there, they'd be in the red zone. If I kept them there too long, they would be goofing off. They would be distracting, distracting the class being very disturbing to all the surroundings. So what you want to do is um, you want to keep your students that are disruptive, that need to be active a lot. Um, you want to try and keep them in the red zone as much as possible, whether that's with your seating arrangements, keeping them towards the front, so they'll always usually be in the red zone or the yellow zone. Um, so those are the what they all mean. So red zone is eight feet, yellow zone is the extension of the red zone by six feet, and then the green zone is anything outside the yellow zone. Green as in go, meaning goof off. So you don't want to keep students there too long. Even if they are good behaving students, if they're kept there too long, they will goof off because they're bored and you're not paying attention to them. Okay, the next part he says is working the crowd. So like continuously move around uh, move around the room. Periodically move within the desks. So it's good to have, um, I'll talk about later the room, how like rooms should be arranged. Um, but when you're lecturing, like move within the desks, keep moving so your students are following you as you're teaching. They're not just focusing on one spot, falling asleep, zoning out not listening to what you're saying. Also, um, make eye contact with your students. You know, always talk to them with your eyes meeting, especially if the students are in the green zone, you wanna make sure that they know you're paying attention to them. You're watching what they're doing, you're seeing if they're paying attention, just because they're way over there, you can still see what they're doing. So you wanna keep that eye contact. Okay, so, Here's a typical classroom setup. I'm sure we've all sat in a classroom like this. 
where desks are individually set up. This is very ineffective. You lose a lot of time going that way, going that way, going that way, going that way when you walk in route. That's a lot of time lost. That's ineffective waste of time, and that's not beneficial. And it also will, you'll lose time if you do a group activity. Students will have to move desks together. Students will have to move their chairs together. And since they're not already set in groups, you'll have this person wanting to work with someone over here. That's not beneficial. That's going to be time wasted. So this is what they, he calls the grid seating arrangement. This is very beneficial to work the crowd. You have two aisles to work with, and then you can move this way, and then they're already in groups. So here's a group of two, a group of two, a group of two, a group of two. And then if you want them in groups of four, they can move backwards. You have them in groups of four here. They can move backwards, everything like that. That's very beneficial for group work. Um, it's very beneficial for work with the crowd. Um, and it will also, for disruptive students, if you're sitting next to someone, it's go the tendency is going to be, I don't want to goof off because this person next to me might be trying to learn. So I don't want to disturb them. Rather than having them sit at a desk, sit at a desk alone, they'll be more disruptive that way. <coughs> okay, so. I have a little setup example on why we do bell work. Okay, so the classroom is just starting. Um, it's in between periods right now, and people are coming into the classroom. Is there going to be bell work today? 
Bell work is every day. You need to have a problem on the board every day because it needs to become a routine. You can't do one break unless there's maybe a test or something. You could also, if there is a test, you can do a review question or you can put a bonus question up there. Something like that to keep the students from socializing and making your class into a social period. Okay, so rules for the classroom. Um, the general rules are pretty much just spell out what the teacher's overall expectations and behaviors are for the year from the students. Um, you don't want to have a large amount of rules. That becomes overwhelming. That becomes, oh, am I allowed to do this? Am I allowed to do that? I don't remember. It's hard to remember those rules if there's so many of them. So five to eight is most common. Um, only make rules that you will enforce. If you have a rule and you don't enforce it, that's wasted air. If you don't enforce it, they will keep doing it. Even if you enforce it one day and not another day, just because you enforced it that one day, they will keep doing it if you let go on a certain day. Um, keep them simple and clear. Don't have like one rule being a paragraph long. That's not effective at all. No one wants to read that rule. Um, and post them around the classroom or like on a bulletin board. Have like rules of the classroom general rules of the classroom, how to behave, stuff like that, or like even like a board that says how to be polite, you know, please and thank you, stuff like that, raise your hand, everything like that. Um, specific rules, they spell out exactly how to do this and how to do that. So those are more specific, since it's a specific rule. Um, and just always uh, enforce them, don't be a pushover because if you do it once, students will think you're a pushover every time. They won't forget that one time. So effective lessons using steps. So effective lesson using steps. Um, a big one is problem solving. So I'm a pre-student teacher in math. So this is a really good idea for me. Um, doing problem solving in steps. How many of you have learned long division, they put a problem here, and you just did it all the way out? Is that how everyone learned long division pretty much? That's a very ineffective way to teach long division. That is how students struggle. That is how they have a hard time remembering, because if you go to step five, how are you going to know what step five is if the problem's already done all the way out? You can't point to step five. I can't even point to step five for you. So don't do a problem all the way out on the board if you're starting a new lesson. It's okay to do that if, you're, if you've been doing the lesson for a while, if it's been going on two weeks now, do the problem all out on the board. But if it's uh, something new, um, do it all out. So here's a video on how, on Fred Jones doing that. What should I do? Oh. Where do you
pretty much want you to do the work for them. They will raise their hand with every seat work assignment you give them. They will do, they'll start it like this, and then they'll go here, and then they'll do this, and then they'll do this, and they'll just keep waiting for you to come. And those are the students, the helpless hand raisers. They want you to go over, and they want you to specifically tutor them individually on how to do it. That takes away from your lesson, that takes away from everything like that. So granted, yes, some students do need help and are very serious about needing help, but for the students that do it with every single problem, doing something like this is really beneficial for them. You can go there and you can be like, okay, you're on this step, that's great. Now look at what we did over here. How do you incorporate that with your problem? Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about the advantages and the disadvantages. So the advantages, I really love the VIPs. That's great for math um, because math is a very step-by-step-by-step -step -by -step thing with problem solving and everything like that. Um, also in the book, I didn't mention this, but in the book he put back, one of the sections said bring back chalkboards. He went to a lot of classrooms and some of his old classrooms and they had completely taken rid of the chalkboards and put them in with like um, whiteboards, smart boards, stuff like that. And I just thought that was funny to read because I really love chalkboards and I want chalkboards in my room. So um, I really like the icebreakers on the first day too because um, it keeps everyone moving. It keeps, it lets them get to know you. It has the students get to know me as a teacher because I'm not just a teacher. I have a life too. I like to do stuff too. Um, I know like when we were all students, we probably thought our teachers were just teachers. Like when we saw them in grocery stores, it's really weird. Um, and then setting a routine on the first day, I really like that part too, um, because I've had a lot of teachers who goof off on the first day with you. They want to know that like you're a cool teacher, so they're just like, oh, that's the first day. You know, we don't really have to do anything. So, and then another thing was, a lot of the examples in the book, they were math-based, which was great for me to use, so that was beneficial towards me. Um, the disadvantages. <clears throat> I did not like the quote on one of the books where it said, it is not your job to work yourself to death while, you, while the students watch. It is your job to work the students to death while you watch. <laughs> um, I don't really like that quote <laughs> because it makes me think that the teacher is giving the students busy work and we're just watching as they do it. Um, we shouldn't be watching them do it. We should be helping them, interacting, walking around the room, um, checking their work, helping them if they're going on the wrong path. And I definitely hate busy work, so I don't want to be that teacher that just assigns homework to assign homework. I don't want to do that because that means either I'm not going to correct it or I'm going to correct it. And either way is like, if I correct it, it's just like piles and piles of busy work for me to then do. And if I don't correct it, that looks bad on me in the student's point of view. I don't like that. Um, I don't really like the zones of proximity because I think it's unfair. Like, I like them, but then again, I don't because I think it's unfair to have the disbehaving students in the front all the time because your students that do want to learn, those students do like to sit in the front. So that's not fair to punish them by putting them farther and farther back because the students who can't behave are taking up the front row. That's not fair to them. Then they will soon become the disbehaving students because they're in the back row, they're in the green zone, or they're in the yellow zone a lot. So I found that to be a disadvantage, but I do like the zones and everything, so kind of on the edge on that. Um, Another disadvantage is I don't like that Fred Jones isn't a teacher. He's a clinical psychologist. He's never taught a classroom. He's done workshops and like trained teachers, but he's never been in front of a classroom and like taught lessons, been like a teacher like for math or anything like that. So I don't, I don't know, I don't like that because I feel like it's different than, he would see a different perspective um, if he was in front of a classroom rather than just observing classrooms for 30 years, if he actually had a classroom of his own and he did teach, I think he'd see some, like he'd see a lot of different things and maybe he'd learn third edition. <laughs> Who knows? 
Um, and then here's some quotes from the book. From um, Some are from the book, some are from fredjones.com. They're from teachers that were helped by Fred Jones. Um, so, well, these are two quotes from the book. So, like, if a procedure is working, the problem should go away. Kind of self-explanatory. Any discipline management technique that is working should self-eliminate. So, I like those two because if a, if a procedure is working, the problem should go away. So, if you're keeping the procedure and the problem isn't going away, then your problem is your procedure. You need to change that. You need to either eliminate the procedure, switch the procedure up, edit it, do something with it. And then this was a quote by Shelly Streeter. She's an assistant principal. Fred Jones training rescued me when I was a young teacher, stressed out and ready to quit the profession I love. Today I have been a successful, been a successful the classroom and as an administrator. Tools for teaching has helped me as well as many of my colleagues. And then this is from Barbara Ugazato from your program saved my teaching career, and it continued to do so until I retired after 25 years at the junior level. Your techniques became mine over the years, and I became a confident teacher with a well-managed classroom. But the fun and excitement of our daily career activities each time. All right, and then that's my work today. And then I have a little, if I can find it. I have a little assessment for you all. You can take one and pass it down. So fill in the blank. So I'll give you, whoever has one, I'll give you about three to five minutes to complete it. So only ten questions. And we went over all of them. <laughs> Thank you. Instructions into numbered steps. 
PAP. The blank zone is the zone that will be most disruptive if students are left there too long. Green. Green. Yeah. Um, blank Jones was the illustrator for Tools for Teaching. Right. Yeah. Blank Jones was a co-author for Tools for Teaching and does training sessions with Red Jones. Blank time is wasted time. Work blank, not hard. Smart. And blank work discourages socializing between students. No. Blank rules spell out exactly how to do stuff in the classroom. Specific. Yes. Great job. 100. <laughs> that was a test grade. <laughs>